since they are flooding me with lights, I am flooding you back with also some lights. <laughs> As Steve Jobs said, be hungry and foolish. And let's be a little bit hungry and foolish today. I brought some sandwiches with me. Now, since TED is also about entertainment, I think the last six hours we heard a lot, a lot of serious talks, which were very interesting. But let's have some entertainment for this show. You know. OK. I have a potato. Let's say that's your brain. And a straw. Let's say that's an idea, a new idea. How can an idea get into your brain? If, say, it's such a simple word such as, I love you, <laughs> everybody knows, understands, even my little boy understands that very well, you know, that I love him. But if it's a, as complicated as of a idea, say, that the Geneva neutrinos left Switzerland to Italy and reached there 60 nanoseconds earlier. Wow! How are you going to understand that if you don't have any background in physics? You know? What does it tell you? Nothing. You know? And uh, let's say that is the idea of the neutrino reaching to Italy. How are they going to do that? It's very difficult, but they have to somehow make a very high energy beam, and then it can get in. Otherwise, if you would just do that, it will not get in. By just the first law of Newton with inertia, it goes in. You know? <laughs> now, this speech is about shaping ideas. I brought my son today with me. We have started some very unique show. We're developing like thousands of experiments, like crazy ideas, as you see today. You think that as if I just came from a supermarket, you know, bringing these things with me. You know. One day I came home, and uh, I saw my mother-in-law very confused, pale, and as if something had gone wrong with her. She said, can you come with me in the kitchen? I thought maybe she has burned the food or something. You know. I said, OK, let's go in. And we went and we worked in the cupboard, and she showed me this lid of a pot, intact. And uh, it was shattered into thousands of pieces. I have drawn this myself with a marker. You know. And she said, do you think maybe there are some evil eyes or some superstitious thing? <laughs> well, I said, <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, let's think about it. Did you drop it? I said, you know. No, no, she said, I didn't drop it. Well, said, what about, let's say, maybe you take to, from the hot water to cold water, then because of contraction, expansion, it just cracked. No, no, she said, I didn't touch it. I just wanted to use it to cook the food, and I saw that, and I'm thinking what had happened, you know. So I walked in the living room thinking what could have happened. I mean, just like a silly lid, you know. And I saw opposite my house, they're building a new building. I said, were there any some construction heavy machinery today? Maybe they were doing something because they're building a building, some cement pumps, they need very powerful motors, and they shake the earth. She said, yeah, all day long they were working. Well, I said, maybe that's what it is. I said, you know, the vibrations transmitted through the earth, and that, uh, you know, the, the thing oscillated more at some frequency, it, it oscillates more than others, and the amplitude rise so much that it broke, you know. And I hear my son from the next room mumbling the word resonance, you know. Resonance, that's not the word a seven or he was seven year old back then. It's not a word that a seven year old kid should know. You know, I would have expected more like a bad word that he could have learned at the school. But saying the word resonance, it made me both feel proud and at the same time saying, huh, finally we are able to achieve some things. And the reason he learned that word, because we were watching the Mythbusters Discovery Channel with Adam and Jamie. They were cracking with their, uh, that opera singer, and then the, the glass cracked, you know, and they understood that resonance, you know. So he understood that this could have been resonance as well, you know. Now, speaking of that building, which was opposite my house, as you know, okay, this is a box, it's just like a carton box. I'm pushing it forward. You all know when it's going to fall down, right? When? When? So, the reason it's not falling down, because I'm defying the laws of gravity. I put a lot of counterweights here. That's why it's not falling down. You know. So the building gets erected this way. And I was watching every day how that building was erected. And I was taking photos every day. And unfortunately, I cannot play it here. But just you can imagine how the buildings are risen, like in a year's time, where the foundation they put a lot of iron and concrete with the rebars. You know. That's how shaping the minds are. 
Now, most of you who are sitting here, your minds are pretty much shaped, your beliefs, your convictions, you believe in God or Buddha or you believe in accounting or physics or whatever, you know. We cannot change that, you know. So, but unfortunately, when the kid is growing up, now, you have to shape his mind if this is like the type of brain we want in this beautiful shape, let's say. How do you shape that mind? Unfortunately, in the schools, the curriculums, the books that I see, they are, to me, not science books. They are just dictionaries of scientific words, and they should maybe be taught from, by English teachers or the language teachers. Nothing is happening. There is no action happening there at all. Most of the books are, sorry to say, young creating books, you know. I, myself, when I want to get, I, I love science so much, I've studied 11 years, I still, when I open any book of science, I say, boy, why is it written this way, you know? Why they don't keep up with the technology that it's on the internet? They don't, the classrooms, they don't make any use of internet. They just stick with the traditional teaching. You know? Now, speaking of that, I brought one example to, to show you how you shape a mind, you know. Now I have a bottle of Coke with water. Most of you and some of you I think have seen my shows, I do science shows all over Cyprus, you know. Now I'm holding the bottle, I'm going to pick up some electricity from the table, I'm going to approach, I have some static electricity, and I say, catch up, come down. Now, catch up, comes down. Say, catch up, come up comes up, catch up, come in the middle, stays in the middle, in the middle, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> now I say, remote control, catch up, come down. <laughs> catch up, come up. Okay, there's no magic, this is a very simple experiment, even like my three and a half year old son does it. You are just pressing on it. This finger has no magic to it. You know. <laughs> now, when some people understood that, and some physicist friend of mine, they were like taking, making fun of me. They said, "Oh, you're like you're making us believe that your your friends have remote, your hands can remotely do these things." You know, and my son said, "Dad, why don't we prove to the rest of the world that we can? You know, just without squeezing, how can you bring it down?" Well, I said, don't worry, you know, unfortunately today we could not bring that because our nano pump failed. What I did, I put a nano pump in and I said, you press it with the remote control and I do that motion that I'm bringing it down, whereas actually the nano pump is like sucking the air in and uh, do that. Now, Andonis spoke about the marine life. Today I was testing the marine life. I dropped the ketchup here and I saw the fish, they are not really that vicious as we are killing them. They did not touch even the ketchup, they did not even create a turbulence around the ketchup. You know. Okay, uh, Andonis, we're gonna talk about uh, sandwich now. Okay, can you... Andonis, how many times I told you don't call me when I'm talking on TED? Thank you very much. All right, now, we're going, we have this mobile phone and the bread, very nice bread. And we're going to make a sandwich with the mobile phone. And Andonis, can you ring me back again? Are you ringing? It doesn't ring. The reason it doesn't ring, that's because this aluminum foil is acting as a Faraday cage. And it's like your elevator, your airplane, your microwave oven. No beams can enter here. This is how it's being protected. You know. you see, these very simple things, unfortunately, are not being shown in the schools. And the kids are very much bored by the, by the, um, by the science uh, classes. You know. We were at Mirtani's wedding a few weeks ago, and we, were, we had to find the toilet. Mirtani is one of our speakers, the next speaker. And uh, we had to find the toilet. We couldn't find the toilet. 
And I said to my son, because he wanted to rush, we saw a very big plot of land opposite. It was quite dark. I said, OK, we can go there. You know. So both of us had to satisfy that thing. And uh, so when, I, when we went there, and we raised our head to the sky, and I said, that, which star is that? When I said, well, let's, let's see if that's a star, first of all, you know, because it was very much shining. And I said, do you think it's Mars? No, I said, I don't think Mars is that big. You know. Then it should be a star. Well, it was Jupiter. So if you are interested in astronomy or astrophysics, you should watch Jupiter. Very, it's there every night. It looks on the northeast direction. Dazzling, like Mirtani was dazzling at her wedding. So I came up with a very nice experiment with that. And what I did, this is a marker. We know that, and this is Jupiter. Jupiter is the third largest shining object in the sky and the largest planet. It almost weighs 1,000 times less than the sun. You can almost call it a star. It's such a big uh, planet. You know. Let's say this is Jupiter, and this is uh, the sun. We know that things rotate, all the planets rotate around the sun. But what if I told you I can make rotate the sun around Jupiter? Now, I put these tapes especially so that I, see you the, I show you the motion. It can rotate like this for five to six minutes. And life is the same way as well. All the world revolves around visionary people like Steve Jobs. He's a small guy, but all the world is using his equipment, Bill Gates. And uh, speaking of that, this light that I have put, I'm not rain, the red-nosed reindeer, Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer, uh, was invented by my professor, Nick Koloniak, and he predicted 50 years ago that one day the light bulb that Joseph Swanson actually created, the first light bulb, not uh, Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison created the light bulb after a year, but because he had patented, he got the credit. But then later on, both joined their efforts, because each one was working you know, with a different pulsation, different uh, electrical mechanism. You know, they, made, they collected the best of the technology, they created the light bulbs. But as Alex, our friend, was talking about saving energy, back then the world population was less. There was no these concepts of saving energy. He, uh, now that we are using the CFL lamps, so the, as you see, the LED, the light-emitting diodes, are mushrooming all over the world. And he predicted 50 years ago that one day the incandescent light bulbs are also going to be phased out. And as you see, already the results, people, they want more economical, cheaper, long-lasting, because the incandescent light bulb shines only 1,000 hours, whereas this goes 50,000 hours. And speaking of that, this is a third-generation lighting. It's called microplasma lighting. Again, invented by the same people at my lab at the University of Illinois. And uh, it, again, goes 50,000 hours. It's very thin, almost like the thickness of two plastic business uh, credit cards put together. The reason it's in a frame, it's because of the, uh, just like to, to hold it nicely as a frame. It was invented by uh, two kids at the university who were playing the same way, like he said, be hungry and foolish. They said, can we take a, to my professor, Professor Eden, a piece of silicon cube and drill a hole and try to create some plasma there. And that was the birth. And then they created, well, both with Professor Sung Jing Park and Professor Gary Eden, the company who was uh, pioneered in these lamps. And maybe soon, like in a couple of years' time, we will be seeing like this type of lamps also like shining in our market. Thank you very much. <laughs>